you know like as sre uh, you know most of the times we'll talk about our war stories as the deepest wounds of technology you know and like hey we had a distributed systems failure kafka wasn't working console wasn't working uh, i wanted to actually talk about that uh, but there's an interesting one so we were a young team a relatively young team who were given in charge of who were given a charge of managing a decent amount of software now every once in a while what would happen is we were using nomad back then for our orchestration and every once in a while somebody would go ahead and make a deployment which wasn't either authorized or well tested young startup you know everybody is being there i guess and every once in a while this would result in an outage because i mean you can refer to the sre book it says that almost 60% of the errors are because something changed either a configuration or a piece of code now the on there was literally no release manager at that point of time and we were a small team who could not really set in those processes that fast so once what happened we did a deployment which was something unauthorized unauthorized or un- invalidated you want to say it that way and we ended up erasing the customer data we were a financial institution serving a uh, product and loss of data is a big uh, egg on the face and so once this happened we went back to the war room and this is uh, we used to travel many countries at that point of time so the person who could do even remotely anything was actually in flight at that point of time so 5 hours later the person lands by that time i mean the loss is inevitable it's gone so how do we go about fixing this problem uh, we went to the war room uh, discussed and we had in hindsight it was one of the dirtiest hacks but i would say the guy came up with the genius idea so we wrote a small tcp proxy in front of nomad so every request would first pass through the tcp proxy and we distributed two factor authentication tokens for the product and the sre engineers and this was a concatenation of a 2fa token which had to be updated a very simple hack 100 lines of code not more and measurement wise our own outages actually went down by 48% just by that simple 100 lines of code now as sre you know like when we went back and we we asked ourselves the first question obviously like if i take, go back into that room and i think that what were the first lines that we were thinking a lot of people stood up and said hey i'll take care bad rca root cause analysis cannot be something which cannot be quantified or hey we need more release managers won't be solved overnight you hire a release manager today a person has to get the essence of it then you need two of them because deployments happen every now and then it's an added budget it's we are talking literally two to three people to be added and they don't come in by the by the hour like you hire them today it's going to take them at least two months what do we do for the next two months so not a good rca what's the third rca well we strip off the deployment ability from certain people not a right way to go about it why because now you have the concentration of failure on just few people who are just sitting there just deploying we have an entire team who has the ability to deploy it's not that they make deliberate mistakes it's every once in a while that they fail to look for something because they are relatively junior and that is when we thought let's go back to actually solving this the right sri way we are coders we can actually think of a small hack by which we should be able to solve this just by adding that extra layer of a security camera not a lock i've always said this if you really want to make things secure don't use locks but use security cameras locks can be broken security cameras cannot be i mean there's a higher pressure on you when you're being watched you move every step cautiously we know that we need to audit this and on top of this there are seniors around you who also have been given the authorization token so they would naturally ask a few certain checklists that hey did you do this did you do this did you do this and yeah so this was uh, one of the most important war stories i remember with a very quick actionable with a instant drop of our repeat failures because that was a recurring thing without unnecessarily adding an overhead of expend uh, expenditure both in terms of time and money and i mean i'm not saying that this is the process but this allowed to set up the process and one of the by products that came out of this which i really enjoy was 
we started putting measurability to every single code and contribution that we're making. We were in a position from there after to actually measure improvements as well. Yeah. I would really like to know how you guys do it at large scale, <laughs> such things. So that's a good one. And that's an amazing story. Thanks, Piyush. Um, uh, with that, we welcome everybody who's online with us uh, to this Has Geeks Bird of uh, Feather session. This is a continuation of the past two uh, talks that Piyush has been having on site reliability, its impact, the key tenets, and uh, how organizations really go through it. We have a panel today, uh, a pretty great one. So we obviously have Piyush, who's the founder at Last Nine Inc. Uh, comes with a lot of experience on different uh, scales in terms of site reliability. Uh, we have Manjot, Manjot Pava, who has seen, who's an ex-Googler, or I think they call them Zooglers now. Uh, she's seen the life uh, of both engineering and product at Google, and that brings in an amazing insight for us. We have Kalyan Sundaram, who's site reliability engineering at LinkedIn. Uh, one of the places where I can uh, say that they've been one of the forefront uh, adopters of the whole SRE culture. And uh, for the audience that we have, we have Saurabh Hirani, who is uh, the DevOps at Autodesk. He'll be moderating and uh, channeling your questions that you would have on the channel. Please, if you have a question during the middle of the talk, we would love to have them. Uh, please raise your hand so that we can coordinate. And last, um, I'm your facilitator today, uh, Rishu Marotra. Uh, I used to be associated with LinkedIn for a while in the past, and that's where I got got the SRE bug. That's where a lot of SRE chops uh, were honed. Um, I'm no longer there, but I kind of carry that DNA now. I think we all do from places where we have been. So yes, um, with that, welcome once again. And it's, it's a very interesting building on what Piyush talked about as, um, you know, site reliability engineering, incidents, outages, revenue loss, right? Whenever we say an incident, this is like a very word with a very neg strong negative connotation, right? So where, where I would like to uh, start, and I'll probably start with Piyush, is when you when we talk about site reliability versus, you know, there's the general, every, every company in the industry is a different term. Somebody says operations, somebody says DevOps, somebody says site reliability, right? Eventually, a lot of, people may confuse um, site reliability with operations or the other way around, right? But what I would like to understand with an example from you, Piyush, is that how do, what is the lens with which a site reliability engineer, right, um, actually take a look at an incident as compared to operations? Is it like a very living the mo in the moment kind of a viewpoint? Is it something where you actually kind of trace it around, plug it, like plug plug the actual cap in the boat, right? How do you ensure, what are the, what is it that would separate out an operational outlook from a site reliability outlook? So you'd like to really understand that and this BOF, like we said, um, is about uh, listening to these experiences from different parts of the industry, from different scales of the industry. So with that, yeah, you, you want to, you want to narrate some another incident or something to us that touches base on these. So going back to the same incident and probably highlighting a part of it, I would say the real essence of SRE is threefold. You know, one is obviously I got a problem at hand. I need to fix this. Mm -hmm. That is one, you know, we need to run towards the fire, towards the bug. That is the first, first principle or was first responsibility that we have duty that we have. Second mm -hmm. is, how do I minimize the loss? So I need to keep the losses to as short as possible. You know, like that's the step one itself. Once mm -hmm. obviously I have plugged that fire, the next question that we have for ourselves is, wait, where else is this happening right now? Or is about to happen if, because there's a pattern to it. 
because obviously this failure is not going to happen in isolation of incident to me has always been a representation of our culture as well an incident doesn't happen in absolute nature that uh, those are software bugs we're not talking about those i mean they happen but they are very well caught in the in unit test cases and integration test real incidents are actually a, a by product of a lot of our culture and our habits as well so where else is this happening that's the second question the third question that we have to ask ourselves is which is the most important one and that's where the real engineering word of site reliability engineering comes in how do i prevent this from happening again if this has happened now and there has been a loss to it first of all what is the amount of measurement that needs to be done to see what was the loss behind this how much did we lose actually and second if it was considerable how am i going to prevent this from happening again and that is where most of the time is spent got it so that's a very interesting outlook so i think the aspects that i kind of gather if i for some reason is like bias for action obviously plug this um holding the ball obviously cut your losses minimize losses um identify any patterns that are there and culture and habits but then the question still so for organizations and teams that are probably very operational in nature and are moving to a site reliability thing are you saying that what are you saying that the operational teams have to imbibe these uh, tenets in order to kind of gra- graduate or make that transformation because it's a transformational journey SRE, I believe, is not really um, much of a skill as it is a cultural game, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. You got that right. You know, there's a ladder that you need to take, step one at a time. I think the one of the first things that you need to do there is measurement. Every put a measure. I mean, you can't improve something that you can't measure. So first step would be to actually measure all of these things. And I mean. Uh, Uh, I mean, this is where I would really love to hear from the. I mean, all of you as well, because you guys are the masters of measurements. Uh, I mean, books and practices have come out of your organizations. Um, yes, while we do that, just a small thing. One of the discussions that was started in the chat panel was around DevOps versus SRE versus operations versus sysadmin. Like, so mostly, if uh, we could some sort of clear some air around buzzwords versus the actual work that goes into an SRE. Manjot, you want to take a stab at that? I mean, that's where the book came from. Uh, thank you so much, Piyush, for uh, first of all the very interesting story and also touching upon what the essence of an SRE is. If I had to summarize uh, what an SRE is, I'll go back to quoting uh, someone I really respect uh, and my manager at the time, um, who said. Uh, the job of an sre is to eventually be able to automate themselves away um and uh, and this is i think you know in one line if i had to capture the essence of how sre is different from uh, say a sys admin or an operational sort of role uh, is uh, how i would characterize it um building upon the essence of an sre um i i used to i used to say things like i have a day job and a night job uh, not necessarily because of the time of the day but uh, because of the two things that i did one is uh, you know being very uh, very fast to respond very sharp to capture things and take steps in the very very short term to fix uh, not i shouldn't say fix at least mitigate whatever is happening immediately in front of me when i'm on call and the other part of my my job used to be uh you know after you know the immediate fire is has been contained really looking hard at what were the things that went right what were the things that went wrong and uh what are the steps for the future most importantly what are the things for the future that we can be worked upon so that a these incidents either don't happen ever again b if they do happen again for whatever reason the the impact is you know much less than what it was right now uh, and c uh, we are able to catch it way sooner than the amount of time we took um so these are some of the these are some of the ways in which i would characterize the the culture uh, of sre at google and i think one of the most beautiful ways in which uh, this can be demonstrated uh is if you look at a postmortem 
by an SRE team at Google. It literally, you know, really uh, boils down what we do. When there is an incident, you obviously have a log, you have a summary line, you maybe have an impact statement. But after that is where I would say the meat is, what went well, what went really well, then what went wrong and how things can be improved. Uh, so I think this is where, you know, some of the aspects around uh, SRE culture not being about blaming, but just about what can be done in the future to make things even better than, than what they are. That's great. That's great. Kalyan, you want to you wanna add your pitch? Yeah. So, so I think the question boils down from what is DevOps, or what's the difference between DevOps and SRE, right? Uh, so I think... A preliminary objective for a sysadmin or a DevOps or SRE at the end of the day is site up, getting the uh, product being up. Uh, so it's a different names given to it. And people have considered, you know, different ways to achieve the site up. For example, sysadmin is a person who actually expertizes um, in, the, in the previous world, like you give me a black box, I deploy it. I make sure that the that de de after deployment, the black box works good. If I can't take care of the black box, I'll put a ticket, um, I would escalate again to you and things like that. In the case of DevOps, it's it's like, so the changes became difficult because the system admin wanted a, a reliability in the system because that's what his job is. And uh, the, dev the development team or whatever we call it, the feature addition team needed to push the features. So there was a stalemate because both of their goals are different. One team wanted change, another team does not want to change. So the whole DevOps practice is supposed to bridge the gap. And the DevOps team is considered to be a team which is coming up, which is trying to bridge the gap between developer and operations. But still the DevOps team also has to have some level of, you know, automation, coding, some level of software engineering practices in them. That leads to the site reliability engineer. So I think it's an evaluation of the process. Uh, it depends on the organization as well. So some organizations will still name up a team as site reliability engineering or a DevOps team, but you might, uh, the, the team might be still fighting for just for the site to be up. So, so I mean, it, it depends on the luxury of time. So as long as if the practice of the company, the process that the company involves is not to evolve evolve the site reliability engineering team to a way where they just add you know uh, nines to availabilities and the architect they have time to architect and they have time to you know do a post mortem and plug those um, gaps back to the system when they can implement those back to the system then then they are on the right track they might not be a site reliability engineering team today but they will evolve into a site reliability engineering team uh, going forward. So yeah, that's that's probably the difference I would, uh, based on my experience, uh, I would uh, I would say, uh, at the end of the day, irrespective of what the practices are, DevOps or system admin or site uh, site reliability engineer, the goal is still site up, and uh, SRE is considered to be one of the best ways to reach that goal. But still, uh, LinkedIn calls uh, site up is the goal of the SRE team. I think it, 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 that that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, for any other organization as well. So that's that's amazing. Uh, Saurabh, you have something? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I remember this sort of links back to the first session which Piyush took when he mentioned the SRE maturity model. When he said that if you want to go from not having any SREs to like a complete SRE org, you should not go from zero to everything in one day. There is a maturity model involved in it. You take one step at a time so that you also organically evolve and not just blindly follow all the tools that have been, you know, floating around. Correct. That's, that's, that's a good point. So thanks everyone for your um, opinion. It's, it's amazing how uh, a question can actually elicit different responses based on our experiences. So working on this forward, uh, let's help our audience um, in terms of understanding some of these things in practice. These are amazing principles and I think um, they always stick. So it would be great to kind of hear out um, some of these uh, war stories that you guys have faced uh, at different points in time. Um, I know you started with one and that's a great one. And um, Manjot, you have seen both the product and the engineering side of um, life, right? While you were at Google. So 
it would be great to hear something impact us. And, and this is primarily keeping our audience in mind because the idea is that while we narrate the story, we touch base upon each of these tenets we've talked about, bias for action, keeping side up, uh, you know, holding the ball, closing gaps, cultural habits. It'd be great if you could kind of uh, uh, tell us an anecdote. Um, absolutely. Um, so when I was in... Uh, when I was in SRE, uh, the product that we, that me and my team uh, were responsible for was, you know, a mixture of uh, Google Photos, Blogger, uh, and a couple of those, uh, and, a, and a couple other social products under Google Plus those days. So um, if you, so we had just, I think, launched the uh, Android auto backup. Uh, the thing about backing up the world's photos and videos is that well it's a lot of photos and videos um, and the thing about you know saving all these photos and videos uh, when you are hosting uh, like a global service with you know billions plus users um, is that these, this is like the perfect recipe for overwhelming systems and uh, what the, you know how it internally worked uh, was we we were using Bigtable as our metadata store. And uh, how it works, I mean, so we as Google Photos SRE were not responsible for the up t up, uh, uptime, uh, I mean, not completely responsible for the uptime of our Bigtable services. Uh, there was a whole dedicated Bigtable SRE team, which is responsible for the uptime of uh, the Bigtables that our service used. What we were responsible for was, you know, deciding on things like schema, deciding on uh, how we actually get to use the service and a couple other uh, critical things uh, related to that service. So on, on one occasion, what happened, actually on several occasions, uh, what would happen is uh, if there is you know, a certain bug that would suddenly upload several more pictures than what we had expected or there is a certain event uh, that occurred upstream um, which would uh, suddenly increase the traffic by multiples uh, is when this whole traffic is basically uh, redirected towards our big table, inst uh, big table instances. And the thing about how big tables were managed in those days was uh, there were partitions. And these partitions, as I mentioned, were managed by a, whole a completely different team. And they wanted to obviously fit in several different services within Google in a single partition. So when you have a single partition for several different teams, where one team is a behemoth like Google Photos, and other teams are, you know, Gmail or some other smaller services which are not as uh, spindle heavy, uh, this one service which goes rogue has a habit of consuming all the resources in that partition. So not only do you have an outage which affects uh, the product in question, which is Google Photos, you quite often notice outages in other related Google products such as Gmail or uh, Blogger, and et cetera. So if I, if I really think about this incident, uh, there, I mean, I'm gonna go back to the postmortem format. There are a couple of things that went really well and a couple of things that definitely could be improved. If I just talk about, you know, a high level about what I think about this incident and when I hear some of your other stories, uh, it is clear to me that as the, of course the size of the company grows, uh, one of the things that definitely needs to be scaled up are some of the processes around how incidents are even tackled, how incidents are even communicated. Um, especially because now, I mean, in, within a snapshot, I've only spoken primarily about two teams. There are not two teams. There were like five or six teams that were involved. There was front end, there were some other related services. There's YouTube because of the videos aspect of it, etc. So, so now what we have at our hands is not only an incident, which is a, a little complex to debug, especially for, you know, someone like, uh, Gmail SRE, where they are basically like, oh, we didn't do anything. Why are we suddenly seeing an outage on our, on our, on our uh, you know, monitoring consoles? Um, you have some complexity around being able to communicate this one incident across several of these teams 
So obviously there are challenges around communication uh, and who should be declared, you know, the incident commander, how should they be communicating, uh, what should be the immediate steps. And of course, there are challenges around what can immediately the big table SRE team do because uh, these services were basically managed by them and they were the only ones who could immediately relieve uh, or put, put down the fire. So what this incident taught us, uh, you know, some of the immediate things that, uh, that the team, both the teams, photos and big table did was A, uh, assign Google photos its own partition so that at least if they, if they shoot themselves in the foot, they don't shoot other services in the foot. Um, that was one of the immediate steps. Uh, the longer term steps was we went back to, you know, really figuring out some of the root causes of why these incidents keep on happening every now and then. And uh, some really amazing things came out of that analysis. Uh, one of the things, for example, that came out was, you know what, maybe when we designed the schema for our big table uh, partition, we designed it in 2008 when Picasso web was a really big thing. <laughs> Um, and maybe some of those assumptions are not valid anymore. Android auto backup is something very recent. Uh, and maybe we should re uh, you know, rethink on how we approach some of those design principles. Another thing that came out was uh, something we could again, uh, you know, do immediately was, hey, I think I'm, we've been running a lot of these cron jobs. I think, do you think those batch jobs suddenly in the middle of the day have been causing some of these outages? And, uh, and immediately we could see, you know, a lot of uh, difference when we at least tried to contain when they were, uh, they were run. Uh, instead of the peak, maybe move them to a trough, just ensure that they use uh, fewer amount of spindles. And some of the other longer term projects also that came out was how can we in general degrade much more gracefully in outages like these. So, um, Mancho, that's a very, couple of very interesting points that you bring up. And again, to make sure that our audience kind of um, for, for their benefit, right? Um, one, I like the part where you said isolation, which is the team said, okay, let us limit the damage to ourselves, not outside. Yeah. It's a very interesting thing. The second thing is around... Um, command centers. And, and I'm going to touch base on it in a bit, because I think on the chat, we have a question, mm -hmm. which is very much related to your story. I think um, it says, what if the outage was, this is by the way, from Anurag uh, Sharma. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Anurag. So it says, what if the outage was first observed by a team which had nothing to do with the change? Right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that team's SRE spend a lot of time just figuring out what are the best practices to organize and response teams mm -hmm. Uh, for teams which use shared data resources, so I think this is this is a great question. So could you could you throw some more light on it? Thanks, Anurag. Uh, and your question is absolutely spot on. Uh, let me start by saying we weren't the favorite team out there uh, in terms of outages, <laughs> and nobody wanted to be in the same partition as us. Um, so yeah, this definitely happened where you know uh, other SRE teams spend a lot of time looking at their own consoles and trying to figure out if there's something on there and. Uh, are they receiving more traffic? Is there some abuse, uh, you know, happening, which is causing this? Uh, so some of the things that we learned out of that was when an incident happen, happens that can potentially, uh, you know, affect other services. Uh, one is the reactive sort of uh, way to approach it where, you know, if they, okay, if the SRE, Gmail SRE notices, okay, my big table partition is acting up, let me at least ping the big table SRE on call. Then they immediately find out, okay, it's, it's you know, photos and we're already uh, trying to fix it. This is the reactive way, which is obviously not ideal. Uh, then there is the more optimal way of uh, communicating some of these problems, which is uh, more proactive. And that is, uh, is there a certain console where people can come and know about these common incidents that are happening, which might affect other people. And that is exactly, you know, the model we move towards. All these incidents, we built internal tools. Uh, so every, you know, solution to all these communication problems is a combination of process and tooling. We built a whole uh, tool internally to manage some of these Google-wide incidents, which were communicated to all the on-callers that were there, especially if, uh, you know, you, it was something that was affecting you, you were explicitly added to that incident so that you could track what's happening. And uh, some of these measures really helped, you know, get around those problems of uh, not wasting other people's time, especially if you can't do anything about it. 
So uh, just a couple more things to add on to that question. This is kind of like this opens up a Pandora's box, at least based on my experience also, right? Sometimes you may be a downstream to a given service and you would see abnormal patterns in your own service, right? You would go touch all the points in your service. You know, you would examine the same dashboard systems that you see that are there in your service. You would look at things that you would know of but then you would be like, you know what, if all, say, all vitals look good, mm-hmm. but they're still, this, the system is not behaving as it should. Now, there are <laughs> only two possibilities here, sorry. There are only two possibilities. One, either there is a vital that is not being monitored, or there's an upstream that you have, which is probably causing this ripple effect into your mm-hmm. system. So how do how would you recommend or how do you usually suggest that teams or people look at this fault isolation or detection mechanism Mm -hmm. because this is like an unknown unknown Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right Um, so i will first start with what uh, you know measurement and capturing some of these things looks like uh, for an average service at google Uh, and obviously this evolved over time Um, what we finally settled on was every single service at Google, even before it was launched in production, will have some of the very, very core tenets of a service being monitored from day zero. You know, requests coming in, uh, what API endpoints uh, the requests are coming in, the, the amount of errors, latency, and some of these core metrics of every single service being monitored uh, on day zero for every single service. So let's say, you know, I, I have a downstream service which is suddenly receiving a lot of traffic. What I can do is I can try to isolate on the basis of client on uh, which particular service it is that is sending me Google photos, a lot of traffic. Is it Gmail? Is it on YouTube? Is it, uh, is it Android versus iOS? So I try to, on my end, uh, through my consoles, figure out which particular, uh, you know, sort of upstream service is responsible for the excess amount of traffic. And my next step as an SRE, while I'm trying to debug this issue, would be figure out who is the person who's on call for this particular service. Uh, quite often, you know, when you when you deal with enough outages, you know exactly which friend of yours is on call today for that one service that is always noisy. <laughs> and uh, uh, we internally, again, built a tool where you could figure out who is on call for this one service uh, that you found out either through your console or through your monitoring uh, tool or through your tracing tool. Um, and and then basically ping that person, try to escalate them. Um, so the job is as soon as you are absolutely sure of which particular point is responsible, if it's your own, it's, it's, if it's one of your own services, try to debug it further. If it's not one of your own services, try to find out who's on call for that particular service on that day and then escalate it to them. Right. So uh, we also have a related question. So if you want to cover that. Yeah. So Ayush has uh, asked, uh, achieving isolation comes when, uh, achieving isolation when using common service platforms also comes at a cost, right? So this may be doable for bigger organizations, uh, can be much expensive for smaller ones. Scale and size also results in designing solutions, like great tool degradations and all those things, right? So any other solutions that panelists would have? So I'll, I'll interject real quick on this one. So this all, this question actually has multiple layers on it. And I think uh, part of this question is also that uh, sometimes in our mind map, when we look at organizations that are sizable in nature, like it could be Google or Microsoft or so on, right? We think, oh yeah, you know, it's a big company, lots of people, dedicated folks per service. There are a lot of organizations that are of a much smaller size, still churn out a huge chunk of business and revenue and system they depend on those systems which also brings us that all of these key tenets that we are talking about how well do they really scale so Piyush do you want to take a stab at this on how you've seen uh, site reliability scale both up and down the down the uh, maturity and the org, org size curve right uh I mean, one of the things that I usually talk about at this point is uh, SRE also has to be seen like a product. It is no different from actually a product being developed. What I mean by that is, uh, and when I say SRE, I, let, I mean, let, I want to really distinguish 
cite reliability engineering as a common word and say that reliability is a function that an organization has to perform. So let's just, I mean, I'm only going to stick to that, whoever does it. Now, mm -hmm. for it to be performed, that needs to see in product cycle. If these days, I mean, you go to a product manager and say that, should I work on a logout button or should I work out on a checkout button? There are going to be very clear empirical data evidences where the product manager is going to tell me that look, this is going to get me more traction, more business value, etc. So do this. A very similar amount of measured approach, a data-driven approach, has to go towards reliability as well. So while I cannot answer in isolation on whether or or how do you build an umbrella which can actually monitor every single upstream or a downstream service and see what is going to get impacted because of me and who am i getting impacted with i think it starts with measuring what are the key revenue lines or what are the important lines that you're measuring now if let's give an example here if most of my business if i'm a transactional website and most of my business actually happens through me being a payment gateway or something and I depend on uh, some external payment processor. This is something which is of very high value and importance to me. An image service is probably not as much. Now what I need, I've, while I've identified that, hey, this is, if it goes down, is really going to impact my business and my product flow, this data point needs to come to me. Now, and these points and these monitors need to be constantly built. Now, what I've done in the past is, uh, I do remember in, I was, uh, I was doing a content startup back in the days of 2010 till 14. Uh, I mean, SRE was still not a common term back then, but we used to depend on external content providers, uh, CDN likes, where the performance of content on how it was being delivered to the end client was a real key indicator to us because if the video was serving in a very poor quality, they would drop off. Now this is an external indicator that's of, of a massive value. So we had built very small. Now taking an, a cube, a leaflet from industrial practices, you know, these are small jigs that we deploy almost all over our tool chain. We built small, small tools. Maybe they're not even reusable at times. We had built a very small one, which would give us a constant feedback of what was the average latency of media being served to the customers from the CDN. And this was, where did we take this data? We take this data to say that, look, if we realize that 480p of a video was actually taking too long, it told us that we need to now start investing in a 240p as well, because there is a lot of traffic which is coming from poor quality of internet. Now, a simple monitor around the down on a, on an upstream service would actually help me regain my loss of a customer. Now, why did we do this? Because we started capturing that point because we realized that, Hey, this is the most core essence of our product. So uh, maybe I digress a little here, but I just, when I look at these questions, I say that the answer is always, it depends on the situation. So maybe an umbrella product won't help it. What it matters is, in what flow path or what is how crucial or how critical is it to the business? And I'm speaking mostly in terms of when I have to really answer, what is the first thing that I go attack and secure? Because somewhere we need to start. So as startups, we are always playing a catch up game of, of trade off of expenditure and also constant maintenance costs around it. So these are the few lines that I will pick up. Say that, okay, I got to secure these, deploy smaller, smaller, smaller jigs there, which actually do this job for me. So uh, that's a, uh, that's Rishu, a uh, sorry. Rishu, I would interject on this question. So sure, please. This, this question by Ayush is something, um, if you ask me, I, I had multiple times such question to myself. Um, primarily, I worked um, as an SRE uh, at Mira.net before this. So Mira.net. Uh, it's a company. Uh, uh, so my, as a professional, me and Mirror.net as a company grew uh, together. So I saw the company scaling uh, along with me. So here, if you see um, that we uh, Mirror.net has branched the company itself into multiple products. And as such, each product started replicating their own infrastructures, right? Uh, so we had separate uh, each team, each product had a separate streaming services, each product had a separate database, data store services and stuff. And uh, sorry to me, I, ne I never had uh, any permissions from them discussing here. So 
going ahead uh, so there was a confusion always with the sre team should we merge all this products together and give a centralized streaming service centralized uh, storage service and things like that which which is actually a graduation uh, as, as such so the push back obviously uh, we had is uh, say one product didn't follow uh, one product had a sub, sub, sudden ramp in traffic or a sudden uh, ramp uh, will you be able to will want it cascade to other uh, uh, other products something similar to what happened with the google photos and blogger and youtube uh, things like that so this comes with a cost so once we say we are going to have a centralized um, uh, storage solution it can't be like uh, there there has to be a cost for the company where a storage becomes a separate organization there has to be separate resources allocated to it there has to be a separate uh, you know uh, continuous monitoring continuous deployment continuous thing it's not like one time job so it's a commitment that the organization has to make the organization has to plunge so uh, once that is made then it becomes the responsibility of the team to subscribe to an sla and all the other products within the company within the organization is going to see the centralized team as a product and this product has to advertise an sla and has to stick to an sla and uh, coming back to the question like how uh, another team which is not affected comes to know that uh, the pro- i am actually a victim is because the upstream is not giving the guaranteed sla to the team so now the team has more rights within themselves to go and ask uh, you have guaranteed me this sla where is it uh it uh, rather uh, in other cases if there is no sla that is agreed upon uh, it becomes like a nagging thing like one customer repeatedly complains just because there is a 1503 that comes up you can't complain on 1503 inst- that that has to be gracefully handled as an exception you should uh, complain only when there is a problem uh, when the sla is not met so that brings in uh, processes uh on how you react to internal customers so it's a, it's a big plunge the company has to take it's a cultural shift itself uh and there has to be a return on investment because of this team other products are going to reduce their you know uh, repetitive work and there is a considerable saving of time to improve the product as such so once the return of investment return on investment is quantified and uh obviously there will be problems once the storage team comes up first because you can't have tight controls but the benefits that will happen over the time will be really great uh so, once this system mm-hmm. comes in so it's a graduation i i say so client side degradation in the design philosophy would be the step one uh, as a short term solution and a medium term to long term solution would be having a dedicated team if you think it makes sense to have a dedicated team then the dedicated teams charter will have isolation will have like you know quotas capacities and what not how could to scale the system and stuff it's no longer a product teams uh, headache so so uh, i have a i have couple of things to ask here right and um, i i understand that again this this is where if i am running let's say um you know a production engineering team or a devops team or a similar team in a organization which is really big versus an organization which is really small now you're talking about return on investment which is great right because somebody has to put in the funds the time the effort to build these functions to build this group and it's a gradual process so can you do you uh, ha- guys have any uh incident or any anecdote where how you guys basically talk about that how did did you guys actually manage to measure the return on investment because let's say there's a huge sre team and you still have you know massive business impacts so you would like to hear uh i mean along with the war story it has to be a war story because hey sorry right life's never easy there it's fun but we would like to hear anecdotes that you would have especially on this return on investment because that's a very good measurement and also if we have audience from a startup world it serves as a great idea for them to say hey maybe this is how i can seed something like this because i can convince the higher ups or people who sign the checks or give the endorsement to say hey this is how i'm going to you can measure it on investment i mean if the program works it works else we would know it does not work so i would like to really hear uh, views from you guys um, starting with uh, kalyan since you were the last one on that topic and then we'll be ocean manjot about how do you really measure return on investment on 
this whole massive culture change, it's not easy for organization to really sign up for. So how do you Correct. measure it? So the return on investments, uh, a very easy way to sell return on investments based on my, so I, I would compare my uh, two ways. One would be uh, the previous org where we actually took plunge for certain services, you know, uh, uh, to make it centralized. Uh, the return on investments there uh, was, you know, a uh, bunch of things. One is the availability standpoint. So once the team has uh, shown, so you start with a, with a pilot project and you, and as the team uh, shows that there is a increased availability uh, to the whole service and the number of uh, outages. So these are all things that are generally not measured uh, in the initial phases of an organization when people just uh, run uh, to keep the site up. The number of outages that happen, number of times the site has gone down, what are all the necessary measures uh, to calculate an SLA? Uh, say, throwing a 404 is not something that would be an uh, SLA miss for a, particular comp for a particular kind of thing. But on a bidding platform, probably throwing a 404 would be something wrong. So calculating what are all the necessary uh, uh, things in an SLA. And uh, these are all the things that at the end uh, goes to the uh, uh, higher up uh, with a dollar number at the end to say how it happens. Uh, so the, so with the dollar number, we the availability front does not we we couldn't quantify the dollars. We we were able to quantify with how many reductions in the number of uh, you know outages and uh, the man are spent. With res there were certain other efforts made, you know, um, in um, in high dense uh, uh, compute settings for, with an on-prem cloud, and that involved a lot of. Uh, dollar numbers stating how underutilized the resources are and how investing in certain uh, set of aspects to make your compute high dense would you know uh, would would uh, would give a better utilization of resources so that's something i would call out uh, as um, as a way how you can measure either you can you can show your output with a, a reduction in uh, toil reduction in outages or you can show it as a dollar number uh, to say, uh, you know, to convince higher ups that this is actually a worthy investment to make and a consist and the consistent follow up because though something that works that looks like really great at the beginning, it might need certain course corrections as we go forward. So there has to be that that's where the SLA comes in. We have to show that the SLA is always met and there is, um, you know, continuous adoption of the new change. Uh, it, and it, it also needs a LinkedIn culture has something called office hours where, you know, um, when there is something that is centralized and there is a problem, the, uh, the people come to the office hours, the consumers, and then they ask questions, they get, uh, this actually smoothens the process of adoption. So there has to be a way to adopt the change. Like you say, it, this can't be a dictatum saying from today, we will stop using your your MySQL services. There will be a centralized uh, database solution and everybody has to use it. There has to be a way, you know, to socialize it. There has to be a way to help people to come to the service, adopt it, and also uh, help people, say, for example, in the big table example, there has to be a schema, help people to understand which is the right schema, which is the optimum schema for people to use. So people should have hands to reach, people should have hands to review, and all these things has to be built. Uh, only then I think the whole change will be successful. So initially there has to be a goal set, which would be a dollar or which would be an availability uh, improvement or a, a reduction in toil. And there has to be a as, uh, help, help people to adopt and measure this as it grows. And uh, finally, at some point, we have to call this whole migration successful when the goal is met. Okay. Piyush, your take on this? On, on especially the ROI part of setting up SRE and especially in context of growing growing companies or companies that are dabbling with it the first time. Right. Uh, well, fortunately or unfortunately, I've been in that shoe multiple times, uh, signing the, the check myself and at times convincing others to sign the check. Uh, uh, I like to... Uh, quote, uh, not a quote really, I mean, I can't use the numbers, but I'll go back to one of the, the gigs. So we didn't, we had a situation where we didn't really have a thing called reliability as a function. And uh, so the first goal was to actually 
I won't say educate, educate is a wrong word here. It has a sense of preaching. I would say introduce the concept of notion of reliability. Now let's forget this for, for a while. What were we solving? Why, we, why did we even want to do this? We, all, we always have this passion of saying that, look, whatever we do, some needle has to move somewhere. If a needle doesn't move, there is no point doing whatever you're doing. What that means is there had to be a measurement of something. So we started looking for what is the exact thing that the business wants to improve. Now, the interesting bit here is at the end of the day, it's all going to come down to measuring losses. Now, there's a friend of mine, Nishant, he actually says a very good, he's my co-founder as well. He says a very interesting line. How do you measure a loss in case of a downtime? Well, it's possible the traffic would have never showed up. So it's always going to be approximate. So how do we take those quantifications? Now, in case of a product company, I do remember our quantification was number of negative stars on an app store. When we were running a fintech company, our Zendesk tickets used to be our measurement. Now, because this is the first and the foremost thing that touches the customer, a real customer. Like I usually say this thing, something broke, no customer complained. Is it a downtime? or it should be fixed, but no, right? Then nobody got affected. Why do you want to even go about it, fixing it? So pick out those points, which are actually going to touch the customer. We started measuring those. Our next question was, do we have, or did we ever get to know in our system? Can we answer this question? When I look at this data that, okay, on X day, a customer had a Zendesk ticket of Y. Can I trace this back to find data in my system on why did this thing go down? How long was it down? Now, next, we take it to the financial team. We took it to the product and the sales guys. And we said that, look, if this thing would not have happened or could have been avoided, how much revenue do you think you could have secured? Or re a revenue is just a number here. You know, like if the company is about number of likes, how many more likes would you have garnered here? If it is about number of shout outs or comment, how much more would you have had? They need to put a number. They need to sponsor this bug triage for me because that's when they put a number to it and say that, look, I would have sold two more dollars. May not worth it. I would probably have to spend 2000 to secure this too. It's, it's not really needed to solve this now, or they could actually give me a very educated stab on the fact that, look, today it's two, but I'm sure if this happens again, it's going to cost me a lot more. So they actually become my sponsors of the entire effort, which I go back. Now, obviously this is where we use our experience and we say that, look, now person, my business and my revenue stream could have improved by Y percent if these things could not have, should not have happened. This is where the business owners take a call and they ask, okay, how much time and money do you think is going to solve this? Now, this is where as reliability heads and owners, we put a number to it. We say that, look, is going to, I think is going to, I mean, obviously after having done our, our own experiments saying that, look, do, how much do we lack? What all do we not have to get there? And then go about it. And then we put a project forth and we say that, look, I could have secured 80% of this by putting in 20% of investment or this, this, this is a very, very data driven empirical conversation that we have. And that's when we get a sponsor from the business and the CEO saying that, look, I think this is worth the investment because at the end of it, the amount of time and energy that we can, we can we spend on that problem is also going to be provided by the business guys. And this is where we get a buy-in from them. That, okay, this is what we are chasing. And that becomes our OKR or a KPI for that quarter. Now, no questions asked. There are literally no questions going to be asked beyond this on why am I even doing this? What am I going to get out of it? Because they don't, nobody has to know that, look, by doing SRE, I will secure. No, go back the other way. I want to save or I want to increase my revenue line. And this is done by actually doing SRE. SRE becomes an answer, not the question. And or whatever you want to call it. Like uh, SRE is just a way that we call it because we coin a term because like design patterns as engineers, we always don't keep narrating the same thing. We use a design pattern. So I say that at this point, SRE is just a design pattern that we just apply and that's problem. Uh, Vishu, does that answer the question? 
so actually i i don't uh, i would definitely want to have more uh, things over here i think one of the questions that was asked by one of anonymous attendees was pretty much the same that as an sre engineer for roi what are the key metrics that you should be keeping uh, an eye on i think that uh, is very close to what you said in terms of okrs and kpis and so on but are there any general ones or would you say that hey um, this purely depends from product to product and nature of the problem it depends on product to product because i said i was uh, citing a couple of examples here on multiple times i mean the journey looked pretty much the same first mm-hmm. identify where is the customer feeling the pain for it because when a customer feels a pain far too often they are going to abandon your product that is something that we need to protect now somebody needs to put a quantification of that pain that if this pain could have been saved we would have grown or we could have gained so much more now interestingly none of this was done using tools to begin with for a couple of months we actually sat down with just excel sheets and i think one of my talks i showed a demo of those excel sheets i think it was the presentation one we just dumped data in those excel sheets you know like as we say all businesses can start with a spreadsheet and this is just another business line inside a business line that had to start and it started off there and just measuring okay we need to do x what do we don't have how much time is it going to take what is the total effort there this tackle the top like pareto principle there uh, you know like okay which is the minimum most effort that i can do to get the maximum gain and that's how you start and that's where you don't need a buy in on return on investment because you are already going with that approach got it so this is this is really good to hear how you kind of get started along the curve right now jumping to the other extreme end of it manjo so usually when you, during your time at uh, google right when um, when you have these mature organizations right which have probably already done the excel work and now have systems to measure it how does allocation really happen for a new product for example let's say there's a team of let's say five engineers who are already taking care of a given product or a set of products and then there are two more incoming so how does this really work there is it like just because you have we it's a sizable company and let's say uh, hypothetically funds are not a problem so you just say yeah let's just have more people at it or do you say let's do smarter systems let's do smarter systems do you say anything else how does it really go actually i'll say something extremely surprising here um, mm-hmm. as much as you know uh, as large as google became as a company there was actually very very actively stress upon ensuring that the sre org does not necessarily have to scale with the number of services uh, in terms of headcount uh, and resources it doesn't have to scale with the number of services they tackle and i've seen this happen uh, in front of my eyes where the number of services and things we were responsible for grew from you know a few to hundreds and what we had to do to make that happen with the same number of people uh, was ensure that as i mentioned right there was a huge 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 stress upon uh, automating the parts that could be automated um, and i think piyush and kalyan i mean they both take the cake i think they touched upon two very very important aspects of deciding on uh, how to calculate roi of where srd should be added what should be dedicated uh you know to work on and the two aspects being pushed up touched upon the business side and kalyan touched upon toil and measurement of toil uh from my experience i think you know it's absolutely true that i the one of the best ways to figure out how you should uh dedicate which teams to dedicate more sres to uh what resources can you add uh, should just be tied to business metrics in in the case of google cloud for example when we were deciding what all projects our sres should be working on uh we actively try to see you know is has this outage a caused loss to our customers like actual revenue loss uh, in terms of downtime in terms of whatever other metrics has this caused google cloud to lose very very important deals um or uh, or any uh, you know or any other sort of important metric like that when i was in google photos of course it was not about revenue it was more about um is this a feature that complete if it if it if it experiences downtime does it very very actively confuse my user is it or is it just something that is a nice to have 
uh, for example, some of the auto awesomes we created, right? They were something that just, the, it was like a gift to the user. You don't really expect it to happen. But if it is, you know, an active sharing by the user for a friend and right, the friend is standing right there. And if that photo doesn't reach the friend, now that's an experience you don't want to compromise upon because that is a very important part of your, of your user experience. So you really have to tie it in to the critical metrics of the product suite that you are taking care of. And, uh, and the way to justify ROI uh, of uh, you know, increasing or decreasing your SRE budget for a particular product is uh, figuring out what those metrics are, actively monitoring them, and then measuring them both before and after the change. So I think this is, I think, one of the best ways to, um, I mean, to show change once it has happened and even before it has happened, come up with estimates of what the change should be. And as Piyush mentioned, it will always be an approximation before it has happened. Uh, to address a point that Kalyan mentioned around toys, this is again another thing that we really focus on because as I said, um, we actually very, very actively did not scale the SRE or beyond a certain number of people. Um, so every now and then, and I think I mentioned a couple of tools that we use internally already. So every now and then we would figure out, okay, is this a particular action that a lot of the SRE teams are taking on a daily basis? which can truly just be automated away. Should we come up with a tool for incident management? Should we come up, you know, should we come up with automated monitoring on the basis of a certain framework instead of our SREs writing bog one configs? Uh, for, for anyone who's from Google here, will understand how terrible that is. <laughs> so, so yeah, every now and then we would, you know, uh, uh, the production uh, leads, the ATLs uh, of Google, uh, senior SREs would decide that I think these are things that uh, you know really should be automated away for the SRE org as a whole, and maybe we should dedicate some part of our SRE teams to building out this tool or this particular platform, uh, and then have everyone use it. Got it. Got it. So that's that's actually a very interesting. Um, those are those are great great ones. I think uh, uh, I think there's a question. Um, uh, question that somebody has asked um, you want to take it sort of uh, no actually somebody i wanted to yeah. add on to uh, the roi uh -huh. part uh, one of the things that i feel was what i learned was to understand what does not create value rather than what creates value right so i have worked in teams when you know people were more happy saying that you know we use chef instead of ansible however uh, <laughs> you know great job configuring servers this year said no see you ever so you know know that <laughs> okay. know that yeah. uh, you know don't be disappointed that using your favorite tool may not create direct value and uh, you know people one of the things that my uh, one of my teammates always used to tell me is that people want to be happy but more than that they don't want to be unhappy so if you can have a steady state system and people are happy with it don't introduce uh, changes when you can avoid them and uh, if you are not making money you are spending money in sre sometimes it's viewed as a cost center and, uh, you know, the direct way to reduce it, if you look at dollars is to see, and that is always the case. There will every year, there is someone in every team who creates a script to find out untagged instances that were created in 2014 and are still running. Right. So proactively looking for these things when you are, we don't, don't have anything better to do is always a good way. And to show that you are saving money is also very important. Sometimes the thing with anyone who comes from a sysadmin background is just to clean up stuff and forget about it. So I think the marketing aspect of it also makes a lot of sense. So I think there's a question on our chat, uh, which is, I think, are there any tools that Google doesn't build but sign up for? We use Workday. <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> Um, there is a focus on uh, building versus uh, versus buying, and uh, well, I was one of the people who who used to also build, so I I think I'm happy with that. <laughs> That's yeah. so yeah. So so that also brings. I mean, this is this is again uh, the the whole part that Saurabh is also now touching. Now let's kind of put process and measurement and business. This is like very numbery. Let's talk about people because they usually say that the most precious asset that you would have inside, inside reliability engineering are going to be the people that you have, right? It's a system which is, which in its concept was built to prevent uh, burnout to people. 
to prevent that prevent things that you know people would basically be um you know like get more productive they would learn a lot more so coming down to the people part of it like usually when organizations start this journey i i know that like a lot of startups they are think they think about making the journey linkedin is has already onset on it it's somewhere right not i just said google is considered to be kind of like a pioneer given all the material and literature that gets published right so when you when when a group of people kind of is moving on this journey what kind of stimulus what kind of mindset change do people really need to have and this is primarily where you let's say suppose there's a company which is very operational in nature for whatever reason right the reasons could be numerous but then let's say usually it happens that yeah somebody comes and says oh we do you know sorry or let's say as pure said uh if somebody is a leader the person observes the patterns goes suggests but now then the next question comes in which is going to be a mindset change and a cultural change right so would you guys want to talk about your experiences on the cultural paradigms and the shifts that happen over there i would take some of them so uh because i think uh, when i started um i started with a team you know which has like the whole company had like seven sres so uh, all our stand ups are like evening cafeteria snacks we sit together oh man this is not working this doesn't work this doesn't look good we sort out or i mean that's that's our okr planning that's our kpi that's everything our stand up everything is done in the cafeteria with uh, of course some of our okr plannings are also about the cafeteria food is not good that we still didn't figure out a way to fix it no post mortem help there but other than should not be complaining about cafeteria food kalyan uh so i think i think the roi is there you have an employee retention there there is an roi but uh, going back to the meet uh so we had from there uh, the sre team rapidly grew up uh, so we became like a team of uh, you know um we became a team i don't want to say the number we became a team who don't fit in one room uh we were seeing multiple products at the same at uh, the time so there so it became the meetings became chaotic you can't have one meeting even per week where you discuss what happens in each team stand ups for sre is difficult and each sre team is working with the product team closely and it doesn't half of the thing doesn't make sense to the other team members who is coming and uh, sitting so there were uh, approaches you know how to like uh, calling out uh, so this is again a young company so we 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 were figuring out processes like we would roll out you know a sheet to figure out what if somebody needs help or somebody needs a representation and then we will have a, we will have slots for them to speak and stuff like that so this is one way of implementing that as we evolve that's a cultural change i feel so once i came to linkedin linkedin had like uh multiple uh smaller uh, uh chunks of groups and we are talking about um, you know i don't know the exact number but something like a 600 700 sres you are not obviously going to put all of them in a single room for a stand up and stuff so now what happens here is uh the process is still a, is still a, a evaluation of what a, a evolution of what we were doing in that uh, uh in the case of the young company here what is happening is a newsletter comes out Uh, for all your customers stating this is all the new features that have been released this is all uh, that's being worked out so if you are a consumer of the service you are updated with the newsletter that's 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 a, that's a cr- that's a crux way how you could reach uh, to your consumers and if there is something like uh, one of the questions that asked right how do i know what issues are happening and so that i don't i i know whether i'm a victim or i'm cause so you you actually need to have a uh, a stand up or something where a person comes and proposes this is the change i am going to do or a some person who 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 or some pro, no, rather a person it's some team which is responsible for an outage being probed where we stand at when situation would become normal so it's like a daily stand up of only teams which want to you know uh, present their case when something that affects be uh, that affects a cross section of the team the stand up does not take something which affects only with if something that happens uh, that affects only within my team it doesn't go to the company wide stand up it can still be sorted within my uh, uh, teams realm so things like that uh, is how the evolution happens where uh, the conversations 
you uh, like like it i i would call it like i i kind of uh you have to you have to keep away certain things as you grow that's something a personal change itself you would earlier know what happens in your company end to end uh what happens in your sre uh, riam end to end but that doesn't make sense as your company grows if even after your company has grown if you know things end to end then there is something that is missing uh the org, the sre team is not right there has to be clear demarcation of ownership and each team uh, has to uh, own their resources and make sure that their uh, resources work with work as expected uh, and all these things together as a machinery uh, runs the company um, forward great that's a good one so i think i think this is this is great to hear and and again at this juncture um, i think i would like to open it up to the audience as an open house for any questions that you would have it's always fun to hear more from um, you guys correct and uh, it it would be it would be like really really um, amazing if the audience can come forward with questions and have our panelists answer these questions all together i think there's one from uh, rishab vora uh, who's asking any recommended resources to get started with sre or pathway to get into sre roles um would the first two know, talks manjot you want it yeah first two talks okay manjot you have a different take on it other than first two talks let let's not let's not have you run away with it um i would say that um just understanding and i i i'm just a person who believes more in learning by doing so you know uh, if you can sort of get involved in uh parts of the production life cycle maybe first as if you're an engineer you start building tooling for some of these production services that's one way to get involved uh you know understanding what kind of problems production systems actually face Uh, or being an engineer one of the infra services uh, also give you visibility into how things at large scale should be what kind of problems they run into how they should be tackled what are the typical solutions so that's one path that's good that is really good that's really good all right um audience please um please flood in with your questions we would be very very happy to kind of do that i think um some uh, another anonymous attendee has a question saying i'm joining a team of sres what would my approach to work be so that i stand out all right this is great be more curious than your colleagues uh i say uh, ability to get bored <laughs> have that uh because you know like the reason i say that is because sre is really really a, a very boring job at times and it demands creativity during that boredom and like over the years i mean uh, a lot of uh, people are i mean i would like to actually say that you know this whole concept of sys sys ad versus devops plus sre i did, i don't even know when i became an sre you know like all i know is there were servers there are servers till date i don't know when the title change for me because i'm still writing the same <laughs> shell scripts and quotes uh uh what what i mean and i have the uh, i was really fortunate to work with actually a lot of people and over the years what i've seen is this was a trait that stood out the guys who were actually never in the board made really awesome engineers who i would trust when there was a fire because even during that boredom they would come up with so many creative ways to actually improve that and that just made it worth it so while a very non tangible skill but uh, this is something that we really have to inculcate you know like ability to actually keep doing mundane work and chase perfection and improvement okay. uh, to the attendees just an announcement to you i mean we have unmuted in terms of if you want to uh, call out your questions directly you can do so now Okay, so okay. I have a question. Are you sure? Uh, how often do you have to work on technical debt items and uh, like technical, like for example, upgrading databases and stuff like that? And like from what I've seen in my organization, it takes sometimes years to do a single upgrade because we have limited resources and there are performance degradations. But you also need to move on with performance upgrades with stuff like MongoDB, for example. 
and uh, uh, you need to do it because the life cycle is ending and you need to move on but and at the same time the software that's running on those databases is have, facing its own tech, tech debt issues so tech debt i think rishu and i did a bof sometime back in rootcon uh, oh. so uh, i i i think uh, where it comes i can see where it comes from you ayush because i i was in a kind of in a similar situation um so this is something the mundane tasks i think uh, uh, piyush was talking about um this hits ir- especially in stateful systems database systems and such like that where data is also important because it's kind of easy in a stateless system you just uh, do a blue green deployment or something and take off your resources up in a uh, stateful systems this is a problem um i think uh, it boils down to a, uh, a dedicated so if 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 i see it it's a repetitive effort that's going on over a period of time like after you finish one cycle of upgrade after after a quarter or two quarter down the line you will be seeing another cycle of um another cycle of upgrades that's staring at you so some level of automation that should be planned over this uh, so that uh, and and the roi that you can show at this point is um, i have lost x number of resources i mean not, not even resources a human time plus uh a, the human might not be interested in doing so many upgrades repeatedly so um as par, so the company has to be convinced uh, your organization has to be convinced probably could spearhead how can automations be fit in uh so that this whole upgrade process can happen smooth uh prob- without any um um without any outage to the system uh, also things that can really help here is whenever if an outage has happened during the during this whole upgrade process uh, this would be a uh, this would be a nice way to push that if we dedicate more efforts in automating this upgrade process as a whole we would be uh, you know uh, we would be a- avoiding these outages it's it more boils down to an organizational uh, will to change it uh, but i think as an sre we uh, we are the people who has to you know Uh, show that there is an roi uh, in organization dedicating people to do it probably an uh, probably coming so some of these things i thought is probably coming up with a design proposal uh, to the organization stating that these are all the benefits if we uh, involve uh, people over a period of time and uh, then pushing for uh, passing that design would be uh, getting a sponsorship for the design would be the right way to approach it because uh, sometimes somebody has to bite the bullet else it's just going to be repetitive and it's going to be it's going to take a toll on the effort of the employees that's a great one that's a great one then um any other questions uh folks um who are connected with us all right so um i think uh, i think this is uh, this is great and uh, i just had one thing to add to what you said in terms of how do you know that how do you stand out as an sre um couple of quick tips from my end one whenever you join an sre team always and this is a personal practice that i have done in multiple organizations make sure you have playstation or a video game console at your desk which is hooked up if you get enough time during work work hours to conveniently play whatever you want you're not being disturbed you're going to become famous real fast because people would like to know that either how you're so terrible at your job that you just don't care about anything and you play things or how good are you that you've actually solved problems that allow you to just sit there play games and actually make money out of your job get paid for it right and usually i do that because it means that the more time i usually get to play video games at work i'm like hey you know what this means i need to start looking for newer problems to solve or look at existing problems to solve them easily right it's just a personal benchmark right try it at your own risk with the disclaimers and uh, we i'd like to we uh, end the entire conversation with a wonderful panel on one note which is uh, we have anurag who's asked this question saying they are a small startup uh, they have one sre right what advice would this panel have that he can share with other engineers in the organization so that they can make the service more robust before they expand the sre team right 
He's like, it's too generic. We, we, we get that. But the idea is any tools that they could explore, right? Uh, anything that they could do. But, but this is a great question because this is so forward looking. You have one guy who basically runs the show. If something goes, things go wrong in production, how do you shift left as you would call it to have the dev teams inculcate that behavior? Thoughts on this? Yeah, go ahead. One of the things that I usually, I mean, first is the fact that you can ask this question right now is a great position to be in. And this is where things start becoming better. I mean, that you're standing up and actually asking this question that how do I improve? Because improvement, asking the question of how, where to improve and how to improve is one of the biggest things. Now, the biggest learning that I've had, uh, actually two of them. One is failures are going to happen no matter what. You know, like there is no amount of insurance that or cover that you can actually have right now, which is saying that, look, I'll be 100% reliable. There is no such thing. It's, it's going to happen. The only thing that will matter at that point of time is how much are you willing to embrace that failure and improve the product from that point onwards? If it is going to come down to that, hey, that one single SRE was a root cause of all failure, might as well fire the guy today. Okay. You know, like because that's inevitable. The, the only thing that can improve from there is that how do we keep improving these things into the product itself? You know, like this is a part that Manjot mentioned very briefly, uh, and I really like that was the job of that one single SRE is to make himself invisible, him or her invisible in the organization. You know, like where all these things, you know, like everything that we've been talking about, you know, like building common organization platform internally is that developers should be able to do their own jobs in the most seamless manner where neither of it feels like it's coming in the way of things. And tools will only go a certain degree what will go further is your curiosity to go to the depth of those failures and ask each time, what is it that I can actually change in the product itself? You know, like we talk about measuring downstream failures, upstream failures as well all the time. Those measurements are really not going to help. The real actionable item that comes out of it is the product itself has to embrace failure. What I mean by that is, if you're going to make any number of calls in your system to upstream or downstream services, write your product itself in a way, the code out there, which can adapt and take suitable actions on these failures. And they will go down to the fact that, look, you're going to use a checkout button, which is going to make a payment upstream is going to fail. There are going to be hundred and ten thousands of ways it's going to fail. Each time it's going to be unique. The answer is not write an if condition block to each one of those or an alert for each one of those. The answer is if I can detect such failures from happening and when they happen, how can I switch off or circuit break or move to assist or make my product go to an deferred payment model? Amazon does this all the time. You know, when the upstream payment failures happen, they just move you to a deferred payment. That's the single most uh, learning that I've had. And that's the only advice I would Great. Manjot, uh, add, yeah. Yeah. sorry, go ahead. What I add here is uh, similar to what you said, it is definitely, I mean, um, I would say make friends with your dev team and enable them to be friends with you. It is definitely less about tools and a lot more about people. Uh, the more vested your dev team is, you know, in understanding the value addition uh, and the amount that, you know, at the end of the day, the, whether it's business metrics or just product experience for your users is improved with uh, reliability. Um, I think it's, it, that is one of the biggest ways in which, uh, you know, you can improve the entire process from, from day zero of um, working with your dev team. Kalyan, you want to have a go? I don't have and as you said, you've seen a team grow. So that's so a then, really interesting point. Yeah. 
So it's still plus. Like, I'm I'm still for for some reason stuck still with Ayush question. So I'd say there are certain debts that the single SRE here will take, will leverage um, for the company for the organization's asks. So they have to be uh, documented. They have to be uh, they have to be uh, known uh, to everybody in the team. So that that makes people understand that this is what you can expect from the system. Like on a day one, uh, you can't say, "Wow, my system is not scaling great. Uh, let's move all of this to Kubernetes and put them in a, a kind of auto auto scaling environment and do it." It's just one guy who is running the show, so he actually has taken some debts. There are better practices, and so it's as long as it's like if the debts that are being taken uh, that are being leveraged is uh, is is with the is already known that we are taking this risk uh, because uh, this is the deadline we have um, it's fine and uh, all the asks all the requirements uh, that the uh, uh, that the system makes should be within the realm of you know the debts that are taken we can't expect something way beyond that that's against the laws of nature so so related to debts and laws of nature there's this one final question i'd really like to take before we close out uh from an anonymous attendee we have who is saying in my past for an application with every release it actually broke the application more and more and the sri was always fired housing than doing any productive work how can we actually work with such an application kalyan since tech debt, since this is this indirectly is uh, going to be about tech debt and so this, is, this 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 i kind of see uh, see it uh, from a debt one second i also kind of see it in a relationship uh, manner it's a relationship that's between the dev team and the sre that uh, matters here right so if um, uh, so if i was not in an organization and i am a single person who is working in the team and if this is what is happening i would say look i am not going to deploy any more of your services but uh since i have to be civil and diplomatic in order to keep myself uh, functioning especially in the covid era i have to actually uh, ha- come up with a um, come up with a measurement i should say see this is how uh, my okrs are being uh, not able to handle this is the amount of failures that's happening due to your system uh, so this is something or or primarily uh, a cunning way is to re- uh, is to reduce the number of uh, uh deployments your dev team is uh, able to achieve primarily that's that's a way um that's a way that, a, that you make the, the numbers actually it should be a data driven way to make the dev team uh, feel the heat rather than feel the heat they have to feel for you they have to feel that uh, it takes certain amount of toil and uh, they ha- you you say that this is what my problem is and that the, the relationship has to be built such that the team feels for you and the team should not the dev team should not think that as as long as i made the release i'm done the dev team should also uh, there can be things like that for example some of the things i saw in um, in my current organization is there is something called a release shepherd a dev comes along with the release uh, with the sri it's no longer just an sri's function the dev team sits dev team undergoes okay to understand what is the problem in the whole release cycle and uh, the dev t- the, the person who is here now actually has a first hand experience this is how a relationship is built then the person has to go back say to his team like yes there is actual problems and that team comes up uh, before the next release that these are all the things we will work on to fix do you think uh, this will move the needle the sre team can have, there can be a discussion with the sre team and then that can that can be gauged you know during the next release so building relationship with the team i think uh, helps and uh, he- helps here and this is some of the, some of the tenets that uh, every sre uh, town hall in linkedin has like act like a owner and build relationships so build relationships with the team is something that will help here is what i feel that's great that's great uh, i'll just like to add here that sorry i'll just like to add here that a lot of the role and responsibility of an sre guy be- becomes about create uh, cre- uh, write a lot of creative tooling and philosophy which you sort of talk with the devs and uh, come up with 
ways to avoid these processes right like a lot of the times we are en- we end up writing tooling to avoid these things or uh philosophy we have to share discuss philosophies where we discuss these practices that oh let's do it this way so that you do not do that but even when we are doing that like it sometimes becomes hard to convince the other person and uh, make them buy into the tooling and philosophy uh but i i, I don't know uh how to deal like sometimes it uh, mm-hmm. it's like you get you can get also frustrated that oh why are you not buying into this right so i i can i can kind of chip in onto that one which is process everybody hates the p word okay by p word i mean the process not the panelists so with the process the overall thing is hey look if i'm going to give you 10 pages of a checklist to fill in and say then only you can go to production there is no way in world that you will hate it and you will look to bypass it i think with the place where we have been doing infrastructure as code and xyz as code it is high time that as a sari you start looking at process as code right if you have a process that you have ironed out yes it will have chinks just like code has bugs your process will have chinks it's okay the more you can actually take your process convert it into a coded system or an automated system make it self serviceable and and in my experience i've seen a lot of uh, companies who say they are successful at sre do that amazon does it by the way they've been doing it for years um google does it um, manjot can correct me on that linkedin is in, is in on a similar path and there are a lot of startups that well at least i've been associated with who actually ended up taking out that route which is hey make it lean and by lean we don't mean that convert 10 pages to two pages it means can please convert those 10 pages into an into a, you know a software driven thing and i think that is where sre also becomes really really important right which is hey i want to have these checks and balances if these checks and balances are automated and you run into them and things just go bad i mean they are just bad but can you come back it shouldn't be that every time you go bad it will be like oh yeah another 20 days of toil for you and then that's where the development partners start hating you they're like let's not do this right so that is that is at least what my which is process as code and i don't know how um uh what everybody's view point on that is but on that note um i think uh, sort of do we have any further questions or chats no, no, i think we have got there was one question yes. on the youtube stream on how does sre keep uh, keep up with the whole picture of product change i sort of addressed it but if there are any things that uh, you know we want to call out yeah so yeah i think i think uh, yeah do you want to call that out or? sure sure one thing yeah. that uh, i feel uh, when working with product teams is that uh, keeping product team and sre team separate sometimes is a necessary business function however building a wall between them and the product team throws uh, something that we have to deploy and you throw something back that breaks that is uh, never uh, something that works in the long run so one of the things that we do is uh, as kalyan also mentioned that uh, be in touch with the dev team as well as uh, you know in the beginning of say a quarterly planning call out that these are the dependencies we have on dev teams versus call out dependencies the teams have on you right keep that communication alive and not only restrict it to your team but also see to it that the information flows upstream also so the department heads and everyone is aware that you know they, that isolation is not created so yeah that's, that's what i think that's a great point it's a great point all right um so on that note um i think we are already uh, towards the end of this uh bof session uh, once again thanks a lot to all the panelists thanks a lot piyush manjot kalyan and saurabh thank you so much for being such a great moderator same point in time um thanks a lot to uh, our audience um it's it's been some amazing interaction uh, we always would love more and more interaction but hey again there is no ceiling to that and uh, i think with that um yep yeah, uh, for this bof and for now we might want to um call it uh, a day or a night depending upon where you're tuning in from uh, so thanks everyone um stay safe um stay focused and uh, we hope that this session really helped Yep. Thanks a lot guys. Yeah. Thanks Rishu. Thanks Rishu. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you.